Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, what will pro promise to be a wonderful lecture by our guest speaker. I just wanted to give a little bit of a background on um, how this lecture came to be. Uh, it is co-sponsored by the Brown Center for Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, and we have um, the director, David Scarbeck, and the associate director, Emily Scarbeck. Sort of <laughs> um, in the in the audience with us, and it's uh, co-sponsored by the Taubman Center uh, for American Politics and Policy. I'm Wendy Schiller. I'm the director of the Taubman Center, and um, we appreciate um, uh, the the hard work um, of Ali and Othniel to get this whole thing organized. Um, and the John Hazen White Senior Lecture. Um, our guest speaker was kind enough to put a, uh, a, a that's a picture of the portrait of John Hazen White Senior and his wife Happy. And they've been generous donors to Brown, and in particular, the Taubman Center for many years. Um, they're both passed away now. So the John Hazen White Senior Lecture was endowed in 1993 by John Hazen White Jr. in memory of John Hazen White Sr., a prominent Rhode Island business leader whose family company, Takeo, is currently run by John Hazen White Jr. The White Lecture addresses timely political and policy issues facing the nation and has featured a vast number of people, including New York Times columnist Charles Blow, Representative James Clyburn, and then Senator, now Climate Ambassador John Kerry, and our own Daryl West, who was at Brown for many years and came back last year to give this lecture. So we are thrilled uh, tonight uh, to present Dr. John Aldrich, I call him Professor Aldrich, John Aldrich, who is one of the foremost scholars of American politics in the discipline of political science um, and in the field of political economy. His work ranges um, from historical to current. It ranges from political parties to Congress in particular. Um, he is the co-originator co of one of the most prominent uh, theoretical frames for congressional behavior called conditional party government. And he um, is going to speak today, and I'm gonna do your bio. He's gonna speak today about Congress, about how Congress has changed most recently, and where we might expect Congress to go uh, in the coming years. Just a little bit of background about Professor Aldrich. He received his PhD from the University of Rochester which I will claim credit for also being my PhD alma mater. He's the Pfizer Pratt University Professor of Political Science at Duke. Uh, he, he has written books in comparative politics and political behavior, formal theory and methodology. Um, one of his most prominent books is called Why Parties, and Why Parties Matter is the second sort of addition, uh, add-on to that book. Before the convention, interdisciplinary change and continuity in the 2020 and 2022 elections. That's just a small sample of all the books uh, and numerous articles he's written. He is the past president of the Southern Political Science Association, the Midwest Political Science Association, and our largest association, the American Political Science Association. He's been a Guggenheim Fellow and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So he'll speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor to questions, Q&A, and then sometime a little bit after six, we'll invite you to a, a light reception after the talk in, in the, um, the lobby of, of Stephen Robert Hall. So here, take it away. Thank, thank you, Wendy. Um, appreciate it very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, David, various centers, various people with money, uh, appreciate it very much. Um, uh, being here, as um, as I've been pointing out, this is the first time I've been at Brown, and I've been looking forward to this for for a good long time. Actually, it's been sort of a a, a, a glaring gap in my uh, in my itineraries, and I hope I'm able to provide uh, uh, enough information, in, interesting information for you that that uh, that you'll see that it's worthwhile. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, this talk, Power Policy and Democratic Principles, Challenges Facing Congress, is a compilation of things that I've been thinking about as I move to uh, begin to write um, a, a book with uh, my colleague, uh, Dave Brody, um, who also is a Rochesterian um, um, and who I have um, worked on the conditional party government that, that Wendy mentioned um, for a long time. Uh, for a long time, I would say 
Dave, we should write a book. And he was going, no, no, we shouldn't. I said, why not? He says, because then we'll be done, and I won't be able to work with you. Um, now he's retired, and so that's not an issue anymore. So time to start, start on it. Um, I'm going to start off with sort of um, the observation that in thinking about how I might be able to piece all this together into a, something like a coherent whole about Congress, it occurred to me that the foundations on which I was trained um, may, uh, may be under, under serious question in my mind. Um, and that is that I was trained, as most Rochesterians were, and, um, and many others, that, um, that what you were looking for was um, a set of an outcome that would be in what is technically known as equilibrium, that if, which you may remember from high school physics, and, and, a, and a bowl with a cherry inside of it. Um, that's what we were looking for. And in Congress, it was especially important for this for two reasons. One is it's the, the locus where, um, where democracy is most likely to happen in the, in, in the United States um, because it's the closest between the voter and the elected official at the national level. But the second is that it's entirely rules bound, has a very strong set of rules, um, and that those are designed int intentionally to try to make things uh, set uh, in, in, process, in, in the process so that, um, so that the outcomes are able to be understood and predicted from, uh, from uh, the, the, uh, that the congressmen know what they're doing. <clears throat> well, it turns out all that's wrong, especially the latter one, it turns, as it, as it happens. Um, and um, so, so I thought I'd start off by uh, uh, demonstrating that by two things that don't change. One of them is that uh, the public does not approve of Congress. It rarely does. But actually, at this point in time, it's gotten even worse in the public's mind, and you'll see in just a second, uh, I'll, sh I'll sh give you an illustration, um, that um, dislike of Congress is at, a, at an all-time high, um, as far as I can tell, or very close to the all-time high that we have at least measured. Uh, even so, in spite of this, when members of Congress want to win office, they basically have to run for re-election, and they win. Nine, 90 percent, 90 to 95 percent of the time, they win re-election should they choose to run. And as we'll see, many of them do choose to run. Um, um, so, uh, so it's 90, 85 to 90 percent choose to run for re-election. So no matter how much the public dislikes Congress, they seem to return their their representatives. The lesson to be drawn from that is not that all of this that I'm going to talk about is uh, change is not relevant. Rather, it's that how adaptive members of Congress are at dealing with the changing uh, Congress in which they are in which they reside to ensure that they can still win re-election. Otherwise, those changes wouldn't be happening. So here's a little, here's the illustration of, uh, um, the, from the Gallup poll from 1975 on, uh, which I think is the starting point for when they asked this question, do you approve or disapprove of the, the job uh, Congress is doing? And you'll see, except for, except for uh, a short spike after 9-11, when everybody thought that for for a good two, three months, Congress was, was working well. Um, uh, it's been you know, uh, pretty low uh, approval ratings, um, even lower than the president's <laughs> approval ratings. Um, and the disapproval rating, there of course is a bad period here, but now we're up, we've generated uh, disapproval ratings that go up to 80, so the last measure from 
that I got off the Gallup poll was 83 to 13 uh, disapproval to approval rating. So people don't like Congress very much. Um, here's a, an, another way of looking at this. This is the disapproval or approval rating for, for Congress as a whole. This is for members of the House and Senate. Um, and you can see even it's much higher for the individual. People like their member of Congress more than they like the institution of Congress. Um, and that's true for the senators as well. But of course, it doesn't you get up to 50%. Um, um, so there's lots of room for disapproval. On, on the other hand, this seems pretty stable. Uh, and here's a re-election rate of members of Congress and, of course, the Senate. Senate shows a lot more variation because there's so many fewer of them up for re-election any given year, and one or two uh, key defeats moves it off. But here's, here's the House re-election rate. There's the 90% uh, members of Congress continuously win re-election when they choose to run for office. And so do I have this next? No. Uh, and, and some very high fraction of the uh, Congress chooses to run for re-election every time. Um, um, and so I, I'm viewing this as the adaptability. So that's the, the context. Now, what did I say about all this, about the institution not working? Uh, let's see what, what's going on here. This is something that people concern, are concerned about um, in general, um, in, in substance, uh, as well as academics and, and so forth. Um, um, I, I'm using to sort of set this up. Um, so these are two people who um, uh, are political scientists doing, but of course, uh, Tom Mann was then at Brookings and Norm Morenstein at the American Enterprise Institute. They wrote a book. It's even worse than it looks. Um, um, and I, I think you'll agree with me that they understated uh, their position when, uh, um, when they, they author, uh, uh, stated this. Let me just start off with some examples. Both just serve two points. One of them is that, um, that Congress, these are, these are selected in part because they're indications that people point to of Congress failing to do its job. Whether that's true or not is something we'll come back to towards the end. Um, but the second is that there's not, there was not a long period of stability and then Congress had a revolution, uh, overturned the speaker and canon in 1910 and rewrote new rules and had another long period of time of just the way Congress worked. Rather, it's changing year to year, Congress to Congress, election to election. So here's one example um, of the House and Senate, but especially the House here, uh, uh, amount of time they used committee, had met in terms of committees, uh, and it's changed over time. Congress that was, that I read about when I was an undergraduate, but my friend and also uh, Rochester PhD Ken Shepsley referred to as the textbook Congress, because it was the text, good Congress that was written about in the textbooks we had, he and I had, um, and Dave Brody had, um, and some others, um, was that it was driven by the committees. The committees were the, the source of of power and influence in Congress. Uh, and as you can see, there is some rationale for that. It must, might be the case if they're meeting regularly during the business of Congress. But then um, in the late 70s, early 80s, it collapsed. So that the Congress is not using the committees at, and to anywhere near the same extent it did, at least in the way that it required actually meeting. Maybe it's all by Zoom. I guess I never did check that one, um, but, but I think not. Um, a, a variation on this is uh, if they're not 
legislating, they can use committees to hold hearings. Um, and while it may seem like impeachment hearings are being held sort of daily, um, it's not actually true. Um, and the number of uh, investigations um, has been trailing down uh, over the same period uh, that they, they're not meeting with respect to uh, potentially for writing legislation. Um, so, okay, um, another way in which we could imagine Congress working is that if, whether they meet committees or someplace else and they form legislation, we like to think of it, well, then it goes to the floor and they have debates and people propose amendments and they discuss those and they vote on them and so forth. Um, and that's, um, that's, that's sort of part of the textbook-ish uh, or at least uh, mythological set, set of Congress that we, that we use. Um, here's um, uh, here, here's uh, uh, an example of how Congress has changed over time. Um, when legislation comes out of a committee or out of the Speaker's House, uh, Speaker's Office, or wherever it comes from, task forces, wherever the legislation comes from, it goes to the House Rules Committee. And the House Rules Committee decides what the rules are for debate uh, and, and action on the floor when it gets there. There's a finite amount of time. We have to allocate it appropriately. We need to make various moves. And, uh, and one of the ways you could imagine it is they say, well, we have mostly, many of our bills will have open rules. People can propose any amendment they want to, discuss it on the floor. If it loses, it loses. That's fine. Uh, if it wins, it's added to the bill. Um, and that was, you know, half the bills or so um, that made it to the floor had such a rule uh, back be, uh, um, uh, the 104th is Gingrich's, um, and, uh, uh, and they're coming as a Republican majority for the first time in 40 years. And what we see is, of course, a massive drop off in the use of open or modified open, which is almost open, but you were some, some restrictions. And in its place, this is, this is specifically closed rules. No amendments allowed at all. So the bill comes to the floor. There may be some time for discussion, um, but there's no amendments possible uh, to be uh, in order to be under consideration. Um, and of course, this is. Uh, a measure of the power of the Rules Committee. So, well, not really. It is, but the power of the Rules Committee has changed itself such that by, by this time, the Rules Committee had come under the, uh, under the influence of the Speaker and the majority party. So they were doing the majority party's business, which says that the majority party is going to approve, and its leadership is going to approve bills and not allow the minority party to have amendments to them uh, offered on the floor of the House. And you can see that's climbed. As you'll notice, this doesn't add up to 100. It's only, what, 58-ish percent, and here, uh, in the last three Congresses, um, zero open rules or even modified open rules. The in-between is called structured rules. There's a little bit of flexibility in them, but not much. Right? Um, and so that's what the, the other is. It just makes for a messier chart, which I have if you want to see it. Right there. Um, one consequence of this um, is that the minority is not as happy about legislation as they might otherwise be if they have no input. If they're not using committees which have minority representation on them to write legislation as much, and if they're not allowed to propose amendments, it shouldn't be a surprise that the uh, defection rate of 
the minority party voting against the bill is high or uh, you know, increasing or that his support for the bill is uh, down at you know, under 20 percent um, by the end of, of these data. Um, and it doesn't get better in the Congresses that have happened since then. Um, you know, my majority party stays pretty much as it is. The minority party defects. Uh, it, they've been challenged. They respond as you would expect them to. Um, and you'll notice it's not easy to pick out when there was a Republican majority or a Democratic majority. Both sides uh, are acting uh, similarly uh, in this respect. And, and once again, this, like this, like this, they're all continuously changing. Um, um, uh, there was a, the, the Greek Heracl Heraclitus that said you can't step in the same stream twice. Uh, I think we could adapt that to you can't sit in the same Congress twice because um, 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 it's changing. And here's another, another example of changing the way they conduct their business. So when the House passes a bill, <laughs> if it does, which is sort of up in the air at the moment, I understand, um, um, or the Senate and the Senate, they're usually different. And one way of reconciling them is to hold a conference committee in which the House and the Senate sent delegations to negotiate between the House and Senate, bring back a bill under the rules of this. When it comes back, it's an up or down vote. Either you pass it or it fails uh, in both, both chambers. Um, the, what you'll notice is they don't do it that way anymore. Um, indeed, by, by towards the end here, there's close to zero conference committees. There's very little negoti direct negotiation between the House and the Senate on reconciling differences between them. The standard rule, as many of you know, uh, is, is, is called now is called ping-ponging. You pass it in one house, like say the Senate passes a, an, a, an appropriations bill. Um, it comes to the House. The House votes for it, votes it down, changes it. If they change it, it goes back to the Senate. They get the vote up, down, or change. It can keep going back and forth because you need to pass the same. It can't become a law if it's passed, if, if the House and the Senate haven't agreed on the content of the, of the bill. So, so the ability to negotiate between the House and the Senate is weak. It's not zero, even if these do zero out, conference committees zero out. But there has to be done differently. And the preferred and most common way is not used anymore. Speaking of appropriations bills, the consequence, and most of the stuff that we've just looked at, these changes, have meant that the Congress has changed what's happened between the election and the, and the bill uh, being decided and passed into law. There's procedures. Did, did they use the committee system? Did they use conferences? Did they uh, have different kinds of rules for debating on the floor and so forth? Um, the con here's one of the consequences of all these changes where uh, black and this chart indicates um, the ordinary appropriations bills passed in the ordinary way, regular. There are, over time, between 12 and 14 subcommittees of the appropriations committee, each one proposes a bill. If it passes before the end of the fiscal year, it's kind of regular. Um, and, um, and maybe, uh, not often, but maybe the government runs in the black. I assume that's why they pick black. Uh, somebody else's chart, of course. I, I don't know. Um, um, the, uh, and then that just sort of stopped. And there's hardly any. Um, regular appropriations bills nowadays, and there hasn't been at all since 2015. 
Um, I think there's, there was one, uh, I think there was one past in that period that doesn't show up here. Um, and we're in the same predicament that we might be facing by, what is it, Friday or whatever it is. It's Friday, yeah, it's Friday. Um, um, as to whether or not the government will be able to spend money or does it shut down? Can I get home again? Oh, oh sorry, I didn't mean to personalize it. <laughs> I, think, I think planes will fly. Um, uh, but anyway, so, so there's one of the dramatic changes is that um, there's actually two things here. One of them is very irregular ways of coming up with a budget. Second is you'll notice that there are, there are, um, there are a lot of appropriations bills and now there are fewer. Um, there are more omnibus, putting several different ones together. Um, um, and um, this is not entirely apartisan or nonpartisan. One side loses, one side wins in this process. The side that loses is the side that wants to add expenditures and new programs, perhaps, to, uh, to the government uh, and fund them. That tends to be the Democratic side. The Republican side wants to shrink the size of government. And one way to do that is to say, we can't spend any money. That's a really quick way of doing it. Um, and they don't do it for very long. But it, the consequence tends to be then something that is lower than it would otherwise have been. At least that's the presumption of, of all of this. And so, um, and so in some sense, the conservative wing of the Republican Party especially wins. Uh, under these circumstances. But this is probably the thing, if you, when I teach class, this is the, the thing that, that throws people off the most uh, in the class, which is that Congress, just House and Senate and presidency together, don't seem to be able to pass nearly as many laws as they used to. And once again, I would say, if you can figure out when the Democrats held a majority, when the Republicans majority from this, you're, you've got sharper eyes than mine. Um, and um, this is kind of a long sweep, 1953 on. So, so, this, so this, is the, this, this would be is the years. So 65 is the Great Congress, the Great Society Congress, the War and Poverty Congress. It, doesn't show up either uh, very much. But up here, you were, you were still adding a lot. By down here, you're, you're adding a lot less in terms of past laws signed into, uh, into uh, government policy um, than, uh, than, than one used to. Um, and this is the thing I end with, I end this segment with this. Because um, it's the thing, if you say Congress is failing to do its job, what would you use as the example of it? Most people would say, oh, they don't pass as many laws. It's clearly not doing as well as it used to. As we'll see, it's, not, it's a co more complicated story than that. Um, but this, this provides the baseline for why it is that the public, I think, thinks increasingly ill of the Congress as an institution. Um, it's because all of these things have, whether it's committees or closing off debate and negotiation or just passing bills into laws, um, have been declining over, uh, over a substantial period of time. So, what is, what's Congress's problems? Well, the usual way of pointing this out is to say we have an increase in partisan polarization and we have small majorities, and I'll illustrate both of those in a second. Um, and um, partisan polarization is not a problem if you have a big majority. 
that was the point of the Great Society was they had such a big majority, they didn't need to have even Southern Democrats supporting Northern Democrats, let alone worrying about Republicans supporting bills. Now the edge is, today, the edge is so tiny that you need to worry about every single piece of your majority, and you hope to be able to encourage at least some of the minority to support you to be able to get stuff done. So it's the interaction of, of partisan polarization, where, as I will uh, belabor in a second, um, it's really hard to get the, you'll see why it's so hard to get the opposition to, to agree with the fact that you can only lose a couple of people. And so that people, whether it's um, um, Senator Manchin um, or it's uh, the Matt Getz and all that stuff. Even if there are a small number of them, they hold pivotal power and can turn victory into, into defeat, which is, seems to be one of the themes of the majority party turning victory into defeat. Okay, so this is the standard um, way of showing polarization. Um, this goes from 1879 to 2017, so a pretty long sweep. Um, and the score is how different Democrats are from Republicans in their voting behavior, right? Um, how much they disagree um, on this. Uh, um, and what we see is, A, a lot of change. Remember, my thing is this. Congress is always changing. Well, it seems to be sort of more or less always changing now as well, and on this dimension as well. Um, it's often interpreted as liberal conservative, by the way, although that's not all be necessarily the case. It's clearly how Democrats vote differently from Republicans. That's unquestionable. And exactly what it means is that under some negotiation, but um, what we have, so we had a period right after the end of Reconstruction, that's why we start uh, where we do, uh, in which there was a pretty high degree of polarization. Democrats and Republicans didn't agree. Well, they fought a friggin' civil war and killed a lot of people um, uh, along those lines. So it's not a, perhaps a surprise that it turns out when you let the Southern Democrats back into, white Southern Democrats back into, um, into citizenship, that they beg to differ from the party of Lincoln. Um, and that's what we have here. And it lasted for a good while. And that was, you know, you could probably kind of say that there was a, a period of this polarization. And then it went way down um, beginning uh, early in the 20th century down to a, to a very bottom um, in the, um, New Deal and immediate post-war period, um, which basically reflects low polarization because there was down here a single majority almost, in almost all those cases, not quite. Um, the, the Democratic Party in the New Deal coalition era, especially Franklin Roosevelt and, and then the the Fair Deal and the Truman and stuff, um, that was divided between Southern Democrats and white Southern Democrats. Well, white was irrelevant at that point. Uh, so white Southern Democrats and Northern Democrats, non-Southern Democrats. And so, and so it, uh, and, and it didn't matter what the, whether the Republicans were unified or not. Rather, the Southern Democrats, which was, you know, that they had almost the entire South, virtually every seat um, at this time was about a third of the House were, were, were white Southern Democrats-ish. Um, so whether they moved one way or the other, whether they moved to vote with the Northern Democrats and created a partisan majority, or they voted with the Republicans and created what was called a conservative vote or a conservative coalition, uh, they were decisive. 
um, just as Mansion and Cinema were uh, in the Senate re in, uh, in 2021 and two. Uh, and so that split was what's going on here. That began to turn around. Um, Lyndon Johnson is reported to have told Bill Moyers, who was an aide then before he became a, an NPR correspondent and, uh, and then journalist of some significance, that after they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he said, he allegedly said to Bill Moyers, we have lost the South for a generation. Turns out he said the sentence grammatically incorrectly. It was, we will lose the South in a generation. Because um, it wasn't until uh, 80s and, and 90s, um, and especially 1994, a key moment, um, when the South became Republican. And the answer for why it took so long, why Johnson over, you know, saw it happening quicker than it actually did was that incumbency effect. <laughs> you couldn't, if you were uncontested for office, you tended to win. That was the, the white Southern Democrats uh, uh, position. Uh, but once it happened, we started to get increased polarization. So that's the increased polarization. I'll just give you a quick look at, this is from the, history of the United States. <laughs> um, um, thanks to Pew, they give us everyone in this. And the idea, what you're supposed to see is that the size of majorities in recent years have been very low. Here's the, the dots. As it says, they're nothing new, but they are more common. And even the, the big one-sided Congresses are not anywhere near the other big one-sided Congresses. So narrow majorities, polarization. To put this in a slightly different fashion, taking the same data I showed you in the last here, oops, well, let's uh, show you the House and Senate. Let's see, do I have this? Yeah. So from this, let's think about it differently. This is how Democrats and Republicans vote differently. Let's think about it differently. Let's just take the most moderate person in every house line them up and say, OK, what you're trying to do is find what most people would want is a nice, moderate, bipartisan, joint co combination. So we'll say, take that person and count the person just to the left and then to the right and then to the left and then to the right until you get to 218. What does that look like? The same data, but reconfigured in that fashion. This is. This is the end of the Civil War. This is the beginning of the new one. Or, no, sorry, this is today. <laughs> sorry, I get those confused. Um, um, so so you could, it's hard. To, you can see that Democrats and Republicans stood differently, or, or conservatives and liberals, depending. But boy, we get up here. This is the most moderate coalition you can possibly put together in the Congress. You try and t talk from here to there or from there to, to there and say, what's our common ground? It's pretty darn limited. Um, so that's, that's the problem that the parties now vote so differently, there's nothing in common to serve as a basis of voting. So it says here. Um, and, um, and you would need to get, if you're going to form a moderate coalition, you need a lot from both sides. And it, you can see why it, it's something that uh, a, a fabulous negotiator like uh, Speaker McCarthy oh, um, <laughs> may find difficult to do. Of course, he's trying to form a coalition uh, of this guy. Oh, no, this guy. <laughs> um, remember, this is the only half. It's only, it's only, that's, the, that's, the, that's the moderate half of the Republicans, just as this is the moderate half of the Democrats. And that's what you still got to work with. OK? So that's why there's a problem. Now, what leads to these changes? 
One thing I'm going to assert is that the Congress we elect has consequences for the Congress that meets in Washington and that chooses legislation. Okay. Why do I think that? Well, so what we did here, what I did here, is I put, um, what we did is we put the most moderate person, uh, lined them all up from one Congress to the next so they all look the same. They're not all the same. How different are they? The black line you're going to see is the, is the most moderate person in the Congress. So this is, again, from the end of Reconstruction on. Over time, there's huge variation on who's the most moderate person. Every Congress may not be exactly unique, but boy, you've got to start all over again to find what the common ground could you know, Between here and here, that's a big difference. Um, um, and yeah, sure, a lot of this is which party holds the majority. That's kind of the point. The parties have separated the, the where the actual middle of the uh, middle is is someplace in the majority side. It wouldn't be the, they wouldn't hold a majority if they didn't hold middle, the middle ground within the set of ranges of them. It changes a lot. I'm not actually going to say, like Jimmy Carter, that we've gotten a Congress as good as the public. Um, um, oh, I did say it. I just did. Uh, oh, well. Um, so, but it's something like that. But I don't want to put the onus on the voter or just the voter. So let's talk through this a little bit. Let's, I think from now on, I'm going to stick from you know, basically this half or a third of the, the time period. So let's move on a little. Oops, there you go. Not need this one here. How does the voters, how have voting changed for Congress? When I was in graduate school, um, the coming thing was to study the advantages the incumbent member of Congress had personally for his or her, unfortunately not very often her, but sometimes her, electoral fortunes. They were able to construct, so the story goes, a, a re-election um, coalition on their own that, was, that didn't, that, in which the party didn't matter that much. They got advantages just for holding the office and using it effectively um, to that. So here's, here's one way of showing it that uh, Gary Jacobson and Jamie Carson have used, which is um, this is the advantage that comes to the member of Congress just for being the incumbent. And it starts off in the 1950s at about 2%, two points. You can figure that's pretty simple. I mean, they won an election. They must know how to run a campaign somehow. And maybe that's, a, that's enough. But then it mounts, and it mounts, and it mounts. And here in 1984, it peaks out at pretty close to 12 extra points. So that goes from a 50-50 to a 62-38. That is to say, that member of Congress if they are just an average incumbent running for re-election, are going to win by a huge landslide. That's just on average. Um, and then it went away. And by 20, this would be 2022, no, this would be 2020, sorry, it's going to need to be with the president. President, I think it's 2020. It's back to back. It's back to where it was in the 1950s. So we had a nice sweep up, sweep back down. Put it this in slightly differently. 
This is the set of percentage of people who say they voted differently for president and Congress. You know, it goes up and then back down. And this is the percentage of seats that were won in which the, in, in which the winning member of Congress was of a different party than how the district voted for president. Okay? Um, and this peaks in 1984 at almost 45% of all seats had a Democratic member of Congress and voted for the Republican, in this case, Ronald Reagan, or vice versa, um, well, it was Mondale, so. I ha he was doomed to failure because his son was taking my campaigns and elections class in 1983-84. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Fritz. Um, I was, uh, any rate, um, um, and this is a pretty good measure of how out of sync the party system was in the South, particularly because there were conservatives who were still who still had those remaining uh, incumbent reelected uh, white Democrats, whereas they were free to vote for Reagan, who was the more conservative of the two, since many of you don't remember 1984 as closely as I do. Um, uh, and uh, Reagan was conservative, and so they voted conservative. If this all happened, they voted for different parties. And that's gone away. It's, it's pushing about as close as you can get to zero as, as we can have. OK, but then what happened? Something happened to turn things around. And it wasn't always party. I and my co-authors, Suyin Bay and Bailey Sanders, uh, came up with the acronym. It's party, ideology, policy, economics, and race, or PIPER. Um, that factor into people's voting. It factors into, their peop into people's voting for president, for Congress, House, for Senate, and increasingly also at lower levels of office, even though the issues, same issues, it just, and they're not state issues. So um, it's becoming dominated by these kinds of considerations added together. Uh, and to show you how much it is, so this is, uh, these things only, the, the, the whole Piper starts only in 88, so we could take others back to, to, to 1972. And you can see, yeah, sure, it helps, it helps you to predict this voting, but 1984 is at the lowest, and from there it's mostly only up. People were voting more and more on parties, ideology, issues, race, economic performance, economic circumstances, um, and not as much on incumbency. And as you would expect, if you sort of separate them out, this is, this is the, the Piper stuff from 1988. This is the total, but this is, this is voting for the the, the measure that Jacobson and, and Carson use in their equations for pre predicting the vote, um, uh, how much incumbency matters, and beginning almost immediately on the heels of, of uh, the Reagan administration, it just wanes down and the national forces wane up, if that's a, an expression. Um, and, um, and voting has, has become nationalized about national things as opposed to district things. And it has uh, uh, therefore unified across the, uh, the, the electorate and its choices between House and Senate and presidency. Um, <clears throat> th this is how far apart the average Democrat is from the average Republican on ideology, as well as we can measure it in the American National Election Study, the premier study, which is OK, um, as opposed to good. <laughs> it's an OK measure. Uh, and this is, this is where things are going with the 
the things about in, in Congress between the House and other uh, Republicans and Democrats in, in Congress. And as we can see from 1972, when I could start this on, the public has been increasing in its polarization as rapidly or maybe more rapidly than the Congress has. Remember, this is, includes almost all of this part of the thing that I showed you earlier, the lack of moderation. That seems to be happening here, but in a different way that's going to be important by my book that's going to come out <laughs> in the near future. Um, I'll, I'll skip over it uh, very briefly just to simply say what, what matters here is that Democrats tend to be on the same side on all five of those things, all P, I, P, E, and R. Republicans tend to be on the same side. That's okay. It's called sorting. Um, the electorate is sorted, um, which is a slight pun if anybody was sort of paying attention, if I slurred my T into a D. At any rate, uh, but the sorting doesn't mean that they're becoming more extreme. It only means they're more consistent. And what's important is that the other party is consistently wrong. And so the drop off is mostly coming from dislike of the opposition rather than liking one's own side more. I'm almost done. I only have a couple more things that I was afraid this, this was kind of f fuzzy. Um, to say it's not, I'm going to give you just two illustrations to say that it's not just the uh, voter. Illustration one is, so this is the cost from 1986 <laughs> um, uh, to 2020 of, that it take, took to, to fund a winning house race on average. And you can see it's, it's, it's more than doubled. That money comes from a lot of different sources. Actually, I have three illustrations. But uh, um, second thing, so that, so money, as we know, some of it comes from super PACs, some of it comes from dark money, some of it comes from us as individuals contributing to candidates. Some of it comes from the, if you're somebody like John Kerry able to fund your own campaign, um, which is kind of nice. Um, but second, second set of things, here's, uh, here's the increase in the number of uh, House and Senate party staff that's funded by the government. Right? This is the, their staff, basically, so I think that's what the CRS report includes. A substantial increase in staff that is focused on the party rather than on the committee or, um, uh, you yeah, know, and so forth. Um, or my favorite one, this is appropriations um, from actual legislative bills, apparently, um, uh, for party leadership and party uh, committee offices from, uh, from my lifetime. <laughs> Literally, I was born in 1947. Um, and uh, as you can see, the House, I mean, this is, these are dramatic increases. It's really nice. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let's see, so Jim Wright, um, Tom Foley, Newt Gingrich, and su successors. One final thing, what was it that members of Congress were doing when they weren't going to committees. They're out of the capital in fundraising. It's the single biggest use of their time, I believe, at this point for a category of things. And these are Senate leader, oops, sorry. Uh, Senate leadership PACs, um, and they also have dramatically increase the amount of funding that they make available. Um, they make available on two grounds, which I will skip over real quickly, to say they give them to the 
members of Congress who are in the most competitive races that are of their own party, um, I might add. Um, and they give them to, the, to those who tend to agree with them on policy. Those are the two things, and those tend to exacerbate the movement towards polarization. Uh, let's just, I'm going to skip over these. Um, that's a, the next book is coming out. So I want to close really quickly, finally, because I'm going on too long, I imagine. But um, oh, good. Um, so this is the only time I looked up in a PowerPoint for a pro professional presentation. I looked up emojis. Turns out this is not, it's not actually an emoji, but it was listed there in the categories. And there's my ray of hope. <laughs> Notice that it's a ray of hope with a dark background. <laughs> um, and, and there are two of them, actually. It's supposed to be, yeah, there are two of them there, uh, two rays. Um, and and I'll, I'll sort of close with that, uh, with a final thing about what, what I haven't been able to include in here that I would like to. Um, um, and these are, the first is that uh, more, it looks like those closed rules, the lack of committee hearings, blah, 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 looks like they aren't passing legislation, the amount of legislation is down. It turns out there's two features of that. One of them is, it turns out the most common source of bills is not the things that go to the floor, debate, vote, uh, propose amendments, whatever. Rather, it's vote, things that come up under so-called suspension of the rules. To, suspension of the rules requires a two-thirds majority. It simultaneously votes to suspend the rules of the House, so they can consider the bill under this. It passes the bill automatically. If anybody in advance said, oh, we, wait, wait, you forgot, you made a mistake in this area, you need an, an amendment, it passes those amendments, and there's no other amendments possible. And it usually limits the, the amount of debate to 10 minutes. Um, that is to say, this started as stuff that nobody, had, nobody was that interested in, needed to be done, blah, blah. It's still kind of that way. They used to be used for naming the post office, the bridge after so-and-so. Um, increasingly, however, it's the way at least some substantive legislation is passed, including at least the defense appropriations bill last year, year before, um, one of those. So that's kind of nice. This, the other, which I will actually show. So that's. This is your last slide, John, so make it quick. OK, this is the last slide. <laughs> Uh, there. The last slide uh, is uh, that the bill, that's fewer bills, but they have more things in them. Right? So this is, this is a measure of how much policy is crammed into a bill. Uh, sort, of, sort of omnibus, not always omnibus in any general sense, but they're more general bills. They, I mean, old days when the bills went to com committees, the committee said, I do education and labor. No one else could touch anything about it. Now there, you know, uh, several different committee jurisdictions are included. Right? So, so we hide bills that are bipartisan under procedures such as suspension of the rules. And when we do pass bills, they tend to be richer and more complex, so it takes fewer bills to make the same progress. That's about as optimistic as I can be at this point. <laughs> so thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you for your patience. We do have, um, I think it's going to sort of open up the reception area if people are hungry and want to get something to eat, but people who want to stay for Q&A, if you could come up to the microphone, that'd be great, or raise your hand. I'll bring you the microphone because we are recording this. We want people to be able to hear your questions. So who, there was so much in that talk. Um, I think that's like a week's worth of lectures, like Monday oh, through Friday, yeah. there's no question. So I, um, who would like to go first in um, asking a question? 
Oh, okay. So it's Professor Catherine Tate. So would you, you say Congress is changing, constantly changing. So would you call this a reform era or they're doing this by the seat of their pants and this is sort of uh, unconsciously how they've adapted to party polarization and small majorities? So uh, my interpretation of it is not that it's unconscious or unmotivated, but it's reaction to circumstances as they, as they, as they come up and confront them. And they, so when Gingrich became speaker, he said, we're going to pass, try to pass the contract with America. He left one bill to be open because it was a bill to be sort of, you know, cause he, because he was trying to protect minority interests, even the other party. They had something like 175 amendments proposed. Uh, he pulled the bill off the floor, closed it. You know, that is to say, the circumstances led them to adapt um, in, in more short term. It's not long term thinking the way my colleague, Professor Rohde, you know, discussed. It began in 1958, and, they, and the, the Northern Democrats had this plan of how to undercut the the Southern Democrats, and it just took them until 1974 or so to accomplish it, you know, 14 or 15 years. Rather, it's a short term, it, there's a problem, take, take a response, and a response that never hurts the majority party is what's going on right now because the majority party gets to make the response. So on the subject of a you know, of, of moderates in Congress, given that many of the uh, at least highest pro, pro, um, moderates with the highest profile, like Joe Manchin, Kirsten Sinema, Mitt Romney, many of them may not be in Congress in two years from now, given that um, the reelection appears uncertain. Um, what do you think that says for the future of the Senate and Congress when we see, you know, fewer and fewer moderates? Right. So I have two responses to it. One of them is I'm going to need a, a wider chart to fit the moderates on. <laughs> um, but more seriously, that's a, is, is an important question, uh, and um, and it won't always be the case that this, there will be a Democratic senator from West Virginia, um, or um, uh, you know um, you know a Republican from Maine, perhaps. Right? You don't know that, but there will always be there are enough moderates in the electorate that it's almost impossible, especially in the House, because you get 435 of them, to completely do away with all moderation. Uh, it's just too popular. And if everybody was Matt Getz and Bernie Sanders, you know, there would be huge room in the middle for somebody to come in and win. So I think there's a, there's a, a limit to how far apart they can be, uh, at, least, at least for the most moderate middle part of it. Um, yes, um, and then we'll, Eric Potashnik in political science, and then we'll get to So uh, thank you for the great talk. Your, your discussion, I think, was uh, largely cool and kind of a nonpartisan discussion of massively partisan politics. And you, you brought up earlier the Ornstein and Mann book, and in, in that book, they argue forcefully that the problem is not polarization, but it's, they say, the Republican Party, that the Republican Party is an insurgent outlier. It's become uh, uh, disdainful of compromise. It no longer supports democratic norms. And that to look at the problem from a kind of both sides polarization perspective is to miss the key driver of our politics. Are they right or wrong? OK, so um, uh, I, it, I, I believe Tom and Norm told me the problem was there are too many me's, not enough them's to make the case publicly. Um, <laughs> Uh, for, for exactly your point. Um, if you'll notice that in that chart, you know, it was the Republicans that had gone particularly far away. There is a problem with that. Uh, on the other hand, it's something we should have some anticipation. If one party is the party that says, let's use government to solve our problems, and the other is the party that says, let's not use the government to solve all our problems, it's going to be asymmetric in how we use the government. What almost all of these 
look at is how things are actually done so that if you don't introduce, a, you know, if this was 1950s and I was saying before 1957 and I said we haven't had a civil rights bill on the floor of the House since whatever it was, 1898 or whatever it was, you know, it would show up not at all on any of those charts. So, so the asymmetry is a part of it, um, but it's only a part. And my personal opinion is that, um, is that what distinguishes the, the people who get most of the headlines in the Republican Party right now in the House from people who vote just as conservatively but aren't as out there um, is uh, a willingness to seriously threaten democracy. I don't think that's true of the Republican Party in Congress as a whole, um, but I think it is true of them. Personal, personal opinion only, um, but it is mine. Does that answer your question? Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for coming to speak with us. I'm curious your thoughts on um, the non-political branch, the judiciary, and its role in possibly contributing to this political polarization, especially that um, you know, Americans rely on the court for a lot of their yeah. civil rights, like until last year, abortion, and since um, like 2015, gay marriage, and now gun rights. Like, How do you see the Supreme Court and the judiciary playing into mm -hmm. this dynamic? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, one of the reasons Dave Brody no longer teaches, writes, lets it up to me, he'll check my work, but um, it's because he can't stand American politics and especially where he started judicial politics, which is where, where he actually began. And he said it died in, on, in the 2000 election. Uh, Bush v. Gore, is, for him, was where, where, where the, the problem arose that entirely politicized the Supreme Court. I think the Supreme Court has done a number of things that are problematic. There's the substantive stuff that's pretty clearly what we would call partisan. But the, the, the way they set up funding um, and made it pos made funding just f just free speech and subject to very difficult regulation. So that was what 2010. Yeah, Citizen, Citizens United. Uh, that was a, a problem. I, mean, I go back. I, I don't go back this far. But in the, in the 30s, to uh, corporations being people. Um, I mean, sure. It, Corporations are made of people, but they aren't to be. They they said that they should be treated as a person, um, and I think that was wrong. I mean, so there's a lot of those things, and, and uh, uh, um, yeah. Um, so so those set a context. The things that are wrong, it seems to me, that can be addressed: partisan gerrymandering, financing of campaigns. Um, um, are two of them that have both had Supreme Court decisions that have affected them materially that could have gone another way uh, than they did without, I don't think, violating either the original position of the Constitution or partisan politics. There was a justification in both conservative and liberal Democrat and Republican positions on either side. It could have gone either way. And they chose what I think was in both cases, in those cases, the wrong way. Thank you for your comments. They've been very thoughtful. What are your thoughts on rank voting? <laughs> so, Wait, do, do you, so I just did a two-hour debate on rank, rank voting. <laughs> so, so you have a couple hours? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> so my position was that ranked voting is superior to 
uh, single member district plurality, simple plurality. Um, it's not so superior that I would use up all the credits I have for trying to get laws passed. Rather, I would do the whole bundle. I would do one of those higher ones uh, with a whole bundle of reforms, which could include ranked choice voting. That would be OK. That's fine. Um, um, it, but problems are too severe uh, that a single thing could be. Now, do we know how? We, I don't know, people may, I don't remember the 1842 debate in Congress, uh, but I did read it, um, uh, in which they passed plurality rule as basically part of the redistricting that accompanied the 1840 census. And it's just a simple law, and it would be changed by a simple law. And the, the irony is that a quarter of that house was selected in multi-member districts, and therefore needed something else other than that. And, but the unirony was that this is the first time we had two competitive mass political parties in United States history being given an opportunity after the 1840 census, and immediately they passed the thing that makes it hardest on third parties. Huh. Huh. <laughs> um, so so uh, that's why they passed it. It could be wiped out with a simple, simple vote, um, a simple majority. You don't need to change the Constitution or anything like that. Um, you don't need to go to the Supreme Court to try to say, oh, hidden in the Constitution is this actual right for ranked choice voting or something. Um, so it could be done really, uh, relatively easily, and it would improve things. It would not, it would not completely, uh, dis and I could talk about it longer if you want to speak it over, over, uh, over drinks. Thank you. We have uh, Tucker and then Charles. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, so <clears throat> we've been reading a lot recently about uh, Senator Tuberville's hold on military promotions. Um, which is sort of undermining a lot of Senate procedure. And so do you see that continuing? Do you see like a new era in which appointments, especially in the military, are heavily politicized and held up? Yeah, Tommy Tuberville. I, uh, um, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is uh, I think it was over lunch somebody was saying, well, what, what are all the rules that you wouldn't ever expect to have the consequences that they're having that haven't been exploited yet? I would have said, you know, until he came along, I would have said this one, um, that you wouldn't hold up whatever it is, 300 or 500 or whatever it is, military appointments, um, just to make your point. Um, I mean, I'm pretty convinced that most people in Alabama understand he's not in favor of abortion. Um, it's, it's, it's a misuse. It would be possible, it, would it wouldn't be hard at all, in fact, to, to blot those out. Um, it would probably take McConnell getting the Republicans to agree to it before Schumer uh, would do so um, and just disallow that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it seems to me a tremendous abuse. Um, I think that it happens to be about the military and. Uh, that is affecting the military is actually weakening the use of that for other means because you know it's, it's his own party that is more in favor of a strong military than uh, and um, and there's you know people are kind of like they are with Trump letting him get away with stuff but seething internally so I think that the fact that it's focused on the military is actually, in the long run, going to be an advantage um, for inhibiting the use of uh, holds like that. It's not been great for the military. Fortunately, we're not at, directly at war <laughs> yet. Um. Um, so just so to finger on that, when you think about it, your point about the way in which the, uh, the, 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 
the measurement that voters use, the sort of uh, scale they use to decide whether to vote for somebody or not, has become nationalized on um, a couple of issues rather than thinking, what are you doing for us? Because Alabama does have a probably higher than average, not positive, but higher than average uh, percentage of people who are in the military or have families in the military. So when you think about holding up these promotions from you know, somebody from Alabama, is probably hurting families in Alabama. Um, but the question is, why do voters fail to make the connection between stalling these promotions or shutting down the government, for example, and hurting um, military expenditures or military families? It is true that President Biden did move a lot of jobs out of Huntsville, Alabama. So there's another reason Tommy Tuberville is angry. But so this goes to a bigger question that I have about this, particularly this graph right here. Could it be that the government itself, the federal government itself, is so large now and seems to chug along and get bigger and bigger in, in many arenas with a larger role in individual lives, despite the, the increasing dysfunction of Congress, even when Congress shuts the government down, Trump, that was a pretty long shutdown with Trump, but generally speaking, they'll shut it down for a couple of days, and then they'll start it back up again for a couple of weeks, and they'll figure it out, just like the debt ceiling and everything else. It goes to the brink. It seems to not do it what it should do, but then government keeps moving and growing. And so in what sense does it really matter anymore if they don't have hearings or they don't do individual bills and they bundle everything up and they get less done? I mean, is there some sort of maximum on how much government can do, and maybe Congress has sort of hit the maximum? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it got me there. I don't. I, that's a, that's a, that's a interesting perspective. Um, I don't. Um, there is momentum in programs that it's very difficult to reduce more than you know a tiny amount each time. It used to be the case you only increased a tiny amount. And you didn't make many um, uh, large changes, except under unusual circumstances like the Great Society Congress or the New Deal, um, in sort of major uh, circumstances. It was called incrementalism. Um, and that was sort of like, yeah, it was, it, and it was sort of like, but you know, Congress doesn't have to do anything. This is what's going to happen anyway. What's happening, of course, is by abandoning the use of expertise in the 435, assuming there are, there is expertise in the 435, that um, they, they basically farmed out writing of legislation, whether it's to the speaker's office or whether it's to you know, Heritage Foundation or some other source. Um, uh, and that's, that's a different problem that's, I think, contributing to this, which I, we don't have any measures of, really. And maybe we should. Um, so anyway, so that's just a long way of saying it's really hard. That's the Republicans' point. Maybe you're you know, a, a, a pseudo Matt Getz. I don't know. Um, it's not just him, obviously, um, by the way, um, even though I keep saying using his as an example. But, but um, it's just really hard to shrink the, the star of the beast. Yeah. We'll close now, but, but I will counter just to say that my point is really that Matt Gates can be Matt Gates, and the government still keeps chugging along. Right. And so that was really my point, is that there's a lot of, um, flick, a lot of opportunity for them to do what they do, ah, yes. and then still, and, and in the shutdown, they'll continue to carve out what can be shut down. So, yeah. um, so. But I'm not willing to quit on Congress, and I think Professor Aldrich is not willing to quit on Congress either. So let's thank him very much for a fantastic lecture.